Well, Josh, I mean, we're here to talk about your fight, but we got to talk about the big news first, if you don't mind. Uh, what were your initial thoughts? It's not mine. I never met her before. <laughs> I have no idea. What? The other big news, of course, oh, that, that yes. Shane Velasquez is out. Steve Bay in the heavyweight title shot. He's I mean, out? I, isn't he married? <laughs> Out of the fight, uh, I'll try to phrase these a little more completely moving forward. Uh, what, what were your initial thoughts here that Cain Velasquez uh, had to withdraw from the fight? Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily classify him as fragile, but he has had a history of injuries in the past. Uh, and as anybody could tell you that competed in this sport or followed it closely, I mean, it's training is rough. Training is the hardest part of all of this uh, in terms of the toll it takes on your body. And uh, um, injuries are a fairly common thing. However, hearing that he had a back injury is actually pretty troubling uh, from an athletic standpoint because you know, your back, your neck, those are some things that are really, really important, obviously. But uh, they're also some of the hardest things to get over. And often a bad back injury means your career is done or surgery. So I don't know exactly the extent of his injury, and I hope it's not too bad, because uh, you wouldn't want to see a fellow athlete unable to, to ply their trade, uh, at least in a manner that way. But uh, what it does say is that the heavyweight division is wide open right now. Stipe, I think, will, will give a great fight to Verdum. Uh, it changes things quite a bit on strategy, but there are some similarities on, on how each fighter is going to approach this. But, uh, that means that myself and Ben, we're going to be looked at as what I believe the next contender for this fight. And the winner of this fight is going to have an incredibly strong position to claim for that spot. I was going to ask, I mean, certainly I know you don't want to step over anybody or wish bad things, but I mean, does it kind of... I don't care about bit? stepping over anybody. Are you kidding me? And plus, it has nothing to do with, with, with me anyways. If I get chosen, it's probably because of my, my uh, comely haircut and my, my snappy fashion sense. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, if they choose me, it's, it's going to be warranted. I held the UFC title once before, and I could hold it again. So I have plenty of credentials as why I should be fighting for a heavyweight title fight. Uh, and going out there and beating Ben is just going just gonna to give them more incentive to do so. I haven't heard what the extent of Kane's injury is either, but let's say it's just a couple months, a little rehab or something. I mean, he's been promised a shot. He's a former champ as well. But at this point, do you think it's Kane? I'm sorry you had your chance back the line, buddy, or do you think there's a chance he could slip in there and, and still get a shot? Well, I have no idea what, what the head office is going to make a decision on, right? I, I have nothing to do with that. But I know that I'm going to go out there and give the kind of performance that's going to warrant me getting that title shot over anybody else. The last thing I want to ask you about Kane. I mean, obviously you're not inside his camp, but the guy's 33 years old, as you said, just mm -hmm. dealing with injuries. Uh, what would you do? I mean, you can't, you, you, you don't know what he's doing, but I mean, do you think it's, would you look at training first, like what they're doing at AK? Is it a situation where some guy's bodies just can't go through this? Maybe he needs more probiotics. I would say eat more sauerkraut. <laughs> That'd be number one recommendation. Yeah, number one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All of AKA, just more Yeah, sauerkraut. just more, more kraut, more, uh, more kimchi, you know, any, any sort of fermented veggies. Fair enough. I appreciate you talking about all that. Let's talk about your fight. Ben Rothwell, break the guy down. I mean, he's been around for a long time. I intend to. <laughs> <laughs> Zing! Yes, mentally, emotionally. Well hit him hit him where it hurts. Well played. Well, what do you think about his game? I mean, a, a guy that's been around for a long time, has a lot of fights like you, hasn't necessarily accomplished what you've accomplished, but what, what do you think about him? He's a big ogre, man, and he swings hard and often. Uh, he's proven his worth. He's got a, a fairly respectable record. And uh, he's on quite a win streak, which I think is probably the most uh, important part of what you look at Rothwell's legacy is what he's been doing over these last four fights. So, uh, I mean, this is a guy that did lose to Mark Hunt on the ground. <laughs> so, you know, he has negatives. Hey, so do I. I have, I've had my moments where I didn't perform at my best. But I think that Ben Rothwell is going to show up the best that he's ever been, uh, arguably. And he's looking to build upon what must be a lot of confidence coming into this fight. But uh, I've seen Ben at his worst. I've seen it before, and uh, I think I can bring it out of him <laughs> without alcohol and drugs, <laughs> just <laughs> through being a, a sportsman at this point. People talk about striking, but I mean, you've been there with guys like Caritana, Viable, Hizo, I mean, top-level strikers. Yes. Uh, 
how does he compare to those guys? Is it canny? Because it seems he's power. more he's more like a less refined Karatanov. He's uh, he doesn't have a lot of the technical refinements, but he's got a hellacious chin and he's got one punch knockout power, which is dangerous. Um, the fact that you can get out there and just get full on, on delivering punches to his face and just keep scoring and be, uh, you can be uh, falsely uh, encouraged to keep going to town on him. And all of a sudden, one shot comes and gets you behind the ear, like with Overeem, or you know, he just swings blindly and, and hits you in the chin like Shab. And that's you. You don't want to lose that way, also because when you watch the replay, you're like, "Good God, man!" I, he must have hit me by sense of smell because he wasn't looking <laughs> anywhere he was going. But what that does say is, you know, he he hits as hard as he looks. He does like he does. Yeah. You mentioned where the, the winner will stand in the title picture. I wonder, where does the title rank for you in terms of like importance? I mean, you've got your commentary going on. I know how much you love training and, and, and you know coaching and that sort of thing. So you've got these other passions in your life other than just fighting. Where, where does that, that heavyweight belt regaining that title, where does it rank in terms of your life? I'm not doing this to be mediocre. So winning that belt is exactly why you get in the ring and why you go on these, these paths, so that you can get those opportunities, so that you can be the champion, so that you can be number one. And I've been number one before. I can be number one again. And uh, to go out there and come back around after, was it like, I don't know, 14 years or something crazy, I don't think that's something anybody has ever done. And to regain the title at my age. And uh, to go out there and, and prove what I believe in and prove what my coaches believe in as far as uh, training concepts, too. So. Did you appreciate it enough the first time around, or do you have regrets that maybe you didn't? No, I appreciated it, um, but it felt, I, I don't know. I even I think the second time around I'll probably have still some of the same feelings as far as uh, you know it, it belongs here. Like of course I'm the champion again. What, what else should I have expected? You know I know I can win title belts. I know I can beat anybody in the world. So um, it was it was a great moment at the time. It would be a great moment again, and it would be a, a hellacious thing to add to my legacy. So what do you think of that promo skills? I think he needs work, but he's in the right direction, and I fully encourage you. Oh, that laugh, that laugh is uh... It's a good laugh. Ben's got a big, you know, baritone voice on him, man. Uh, that's, that's a good thing to use. I, I wish sometimes I could, I could have that deep, 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 very whitish sort of uh, tone to me. So you, you were out for almost two years before uh, the Roy fight in September. Do you, do you feel like a new, a new flyer? Because I know you have a lot of things going on. You're doing the commentary, I believe. But do you feel like a new, new flyer to fight after that right Uh No, not necessarily. I just feel like uh, everything in your life is connected to some degree. And uh, you know, for me, it's about trying to move ahead and move forward and improve and grow constantly as a human being. This is part of that. Now, this is something I've been involved with for a very long time, something I put a lot of energy into. Um, but you know, I, it's not enough to just win in fighting and to grow in fighting. I have to grow everywhere. So, uh, according to my girlfriend anyways, <laughs> so, uh, I just need to, uh, keep, keep moving forward and keep building upon this as, as the success will continue in the gym and in the, in the ring, success will continue in other ways too. Was there any point during that time off that you thought, eh, I don't really need to come back. I have all these other things going on. Well, I, I feel like that all the time. I don't need to do anything yeah. uh, as far as um, you're in your typical sense. I need to do it because I need to do it. I need to go out there and fight and get the most out of my athletic opportunities and go out there and, and win that title back for myself and, and do those sort of things. But need, I could just quit fighting. I could leave this and go, hey, thanks for the ribeye. I'm done. <laughs> and uh, I got plenty of things to keep me busy. Right. You know, fighting is not the only thing in my life. And it never was the only thing in my life, but uh, um, I have other pathways if I have to apply a trade. And I wouldn't be sad about doing these other things either. You know, I, I enjoy them as well. So what, what motivates you to keep going? Is it the title? Is caffeine. It the <laughs> I've had a decent amount of caffeine this morning to be as sharp as possible. Uh, I don't know how effective that's been so far, but the day's not over yet. How important is that to have Caffeine? <laughs> I don't know, man. It's, it's pretty up there. I am from Seattle. Not like 
said that writing is a, hasn't been like the number one thing controlling your life the last 10, 12 years. Like, is that important? Like, Personal motivation. Your own reasons for doing whatever it is, your raison d'etre, whatever you've decided how to approach life and how to accomplish it and how to conquer it, that is it. And fighting is a part of it. And it, it fighting, what it requires is unique to itself as well as anything else you do. So as, it's not just time invested towards mastery of something. It's everything has its own process. Well, fighting's process takes a, a very, very uh, focused um, uh, individual, uh, focused as part of your life because someone's going to go out there and try to beat you up. You know, this is not the sort of thing like, ah, you know, that I don't quite have my macros down for final cut, so it takes me longer to edit it. It's okay, it takes you longer to edit it, but no one's going to come up if you don't do it in 15 minutes and wallop you in the face of the baseball bat. That would make you a little more focused towards, <laughs> towards getting that, that process down. And if you could actually figure out all the ways on how to use Final Cut, I, I think you would probably be the only person in the world to really. I don't even know how people use Photoshop, man. That stuff is completely foreign to me. Adobe make great products, but it, it takes like an electrical engineer just to figure out how to open the manual, it seems like. <laughs> so uh, for me, you know, fighting is something I started with. It was a huge passion of mine and it still is and I always wanted to be the best fighter in the world I always wanted to be the best Josh Barnett as a fighter I could be too so uh, you know I, I have to put the efforts into it to achieve those goals but at the same time I have to put those efforts towards being the best me as a person I could be and I know that sounds like some sort of a general platitude or something you read in a shitty book like The Secret but uh, <laughs> And it is shitty. You can't just will things into your life. That's just an idiotic thing. The guy probably also thinks that everything comes for a reason, which it doesn't. Yeah. Or it does, and that the reason was because I made it happen. I picked up the bread and ate it. <laughs> Fuck, man. So uh, I have to, you know, whatever potential that lies within me is there, but not unless I put the effort into it, unless I put the work into it, unless I... I put the energy into developing those things, however that path may, may come. And so I've only got so much time on this earth, and then that's it. So I better make the most of it. Right now, fighting is, is pretty much number one in my life. But I guess, honestly, it's number two to being just the best me that I could be. So... You see a guy like Conor McGregor, he's, like, he's you know, obsessed with fighting, he's mm -hmm. always talking about stuff. I mean, do you feel like that's unhealthy as a fighter? I mean, he's obviously still very young in his career, but it seems like some guys say you, ha you have to live it and nothing else. And you're saying, I think you're better off when you have a little bit outside of fighting. I think you have to do what you have to do at the time that you have to do it. <sighs> Man, what a bullshit. <laughs> okay, so awesome. basically, uh, everything is fluid at this moment that's what Connor needs to do. Or at least that's what he believes he needs to do. And only time will tell him if he is wrong. But so far, it's been successful for him. Uh, there was a time, a, a, a large portion of my life, where I was the same way, where almost all I did was spend time on fighting and training and watching fighting and doing all of that, especially early, early on, uh, because uh, uh, there weren't, the, the options, the platforms didn't exist. So if I wanted to find out what it looked like to see, you know, a shoot though trained fighter, I had to go find a tape somewhere and go watch it. If I wanted to know what was going on in Brazil, I had to get on the combat list, and then someone would give me the updates, and I had to go ch chase down, well, who's this black belt guy that's been beating, or who's the guy that just knocked out this black belt? I, I had to spend a, a lot of effort to figure out what was going on and to, to, un to try to understand what the landscape of fighting was on a global scale. And, how that could impact me on my individual scale and what I'm trying to do as a fighter and how I'm trying to even get into fighting. So, uh, so, so much changes with time and with the environment around you. And so now you can go to McDojo's that are basically MMA schools. You can go to, you can go to Sports Authority and uh, buy MMA gear. You couldn't do that when I started. So. As time changes, so does the way in which you have to approach things. And right now, I don't need to eat, sleep, 
and breathe fighting. I've done this for near 20 years. I've, I've been training over 20 years. There are things that I understand about fighting that other people do not, and some people never will. And uh, the way, so what I need to do to, to work on things and to my efforts into fighting is different from what somebody else does. And when I was at Connor's age, I'd probably be more like him. What do you think about his work in, in the promotional side of things? He's well, he's choosing, he, he's a, it's a double-edged sword, what he's doing. It's effective, but only as long as much as you win. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can play it off of, uh, of even a loss. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time going into how to <laughs> create a, a potential PR aspect of your career. But, you know, he, he's pushing the buttons and he's making sure that you care about him, even if the majority of it is hate. Or, you know, and then you get, because he's so extreme in one direction, he can, he, sometimes you get love from the other side because, you know, people want to rally behind the person that has such a strong opinion. I mean, people are really jazzed about Trump because he just opens his mouth constantly and says just idiotic, completely just, uh, <laughs> just inane stuff. Just like, wow, really, dude? Why would you just, that's such an obnoxious thing to say. And... To me, it's almost so over the top that I, I almost don't believe that he really believes that. I think he might be trolling a bunch of people. Met the man before. He was really nice, you know? Uh, and he seemed pretty bright behind his eyes. So who knows, right? But strong opinions get emotions, get reactions. So, uh, but like I said with Connor, if he loses, man, the backlash is going to be bad. But, I, you know, it, I don't know if he's prepared for that in that maybe he, the way to approach that is to purposefully upset everybody. And if you, if you go down and go down in flames, as long as you know that that's coming, and it's like, all right, well, you know, I earned it, but those, those flames could be used to stoke fires in a different direction, then you're okay. But if you're believing everything you say and you let that stuff get to you, you're going to have a really hard life. Because you, do, especially when you don't understand that you created all that animosity in the first place. Yeah, but you know what, Josh? People used to not always like you. You weren't. You're not a warm and fuzzy, cuddly guy. Nope. Um, I use it. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. That, is I that use by it. design, or is that by is that just a simple fact of who you are? Or was that somewhat manipulated to play a role? I'm not uh, cozy and cuddly necessarily, unless your name's Colleen Schneider. I know, yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, no, I, I don't really care what the reaction of things are for me. I, that's not how I live my life. And yet, and, you know, although maybe I am manipulating the public in some ways, because that is definitely something I would do and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the biggest thing is, man, when you want to go through life, you can't, you can't be doing things for what other people think about you. You have to do it for what you think about you, and that's it. And, you know, there maybe there's some people around you in life that have opinions that you highly regard. And it's good to listen to them. But otherwise, as much as I like the public, just fine. Uh, and I've had great uh, interactions with them over the years and will probably continue to do so and, and like the fans and love the fact they get all this entertainment out of it. You know, I've, I've gotten flack before saying I don't do it for the fans. And I don't. Because if I did it for other people, if I did it for someone other than myself, then it would be for the completely wrong reasons. And I think that if you're a fan of me, you would understand and enjoy and be glad that I do it for my reasons. And that what it is, is it's an example for anybody out there to do things for their own reasons, to be the, the individual they want to be and stick behind who they are. And if they make mistakes, you make mistakes. And all right, that's it. Fine, we move on. And if... You're having success, you just, you roll with it, you keep going and act like you've been there before. But certainly there have been big influences on you, for example, the way, you know, before obviously we know you have to wear the Reebok shorts now, but the style that you would fight in, the, the clothes mm -hmm. that you would wear, the, the metal, the war master, and you went from baby face assassin to the war master. Certainly, I'm just curious what, you know, over the years, what has influenced you the most in terms of how you wanted to even approach Well, it? I was lucky to be dubbed the war master. Uh, I believe on the... Fox uh, rode the octagon, they said, self-proclaimed self or self, 
Like, no, you don't get to pick your your nicknames. Bolt Thrower gave me the nickname, the War okay. Master, just like Babyface Assassin was T.J. Thompson and Matt Hume. And I first heard that, and I went, oh, Babyface Assassin? <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> but it's all right, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I learned to live with it, and it was okay. Um, but metal music and the style that I choose, the, the clothes I'm wearing today, this is me. I don't come out here to do this for anyone but myself. So uh, that's it, man. You, you do your thing for you. You have your own sense of style. People, you know, David Bowie didn't do what he did because he thought everyone was going to dig, uh, 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 what is the, the term? Not asexual, but uh, androgynous, androgynous yeah. spaceman. No, he just did what he, what he wanted to do. He created what he wanted to create. Just as much as, you know, Watain doesn't really care if you don't like people covered in actual animal blood singing about Satan. You know what I mean? They do what they do because this is what this is their form of creation. I am the same way. I don't do it for to, to see if anybody likes it. I do it because this is how I want to be. This is how I want to present myself. This is the, the person that I am. I am curious too about um you're a, a Satan? No. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, they don't have those little pamphlets, those little cheesy comics like the Christians do, right? <laughs> little Bobby accidentally had his hand touch him in the wrong way, and now, who <laughs> knows? Well. No, you, you've, uh, you've been around the game so long. I'm curious. It's kind of what we were touching on a little bit uh, ago with the sort of new school and the new way people do this. But, you know, you've seen the change. People, some people say that the, it's not as exciting anymore because people fight for points and it's too, you know, there's too much of a technical approach. Whereas in the old days, the guys just went in there and threw down. And do you see do you see a difference in the way the fighters are even approaching the game? And do you feel it's positive yes. or negative? Fighters want to be famous. Fighters want to make a lot of money. But we all want to make a lot of money. Right. But wanting to be famous is stupid. Yeah. Wanting to have fame, to use it as a tool to help your career, that's not stupid. That's the business side of things. Wanting to be famous says to me that you're trying to fill a void of some sort, that you're looking for some sort of gratification that you can't find within yourself. That's a failure, even if you become famous. You haven't actually, you haven't done anything. You haven't fixed the issue within yourself. What you've done is you've buttressed it with a bunch of stuff that doesn't mean anything from people that don't even know you. So, good luck with that. Um, and in part of that, is that how people, certain people approach social media and, and that, do you see that? As well, I'm sure it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's all apart. It's all intertwined at this point. So, you know, you can't pick any one thing and say any, that this is an exception to that. It's, it's, all, of it. it's all of it now. It's just the, the widening scope of what uh, being an entertainer is in this day and age. We're athletes, but we're entertainers too. Um, and uh, yes, fighters do fight for points now. Fighters have, and that's not surprising because any sport uh, or any contest, people will look to game the system. If you sit down and you play Monopoly or Sorry or Parcheesi, which nobody's going to know what that is just about, <laughs> uh, they're going to read those rules and there's always going to be those people that are going to go, ah, oh, but they, but if I do this, it doesn't say I can't, and it doesn't say it's against the rules, so I'm gonna use this loophole to exploit the system. Fighters are gonna be no different. They're gonna exploit the system. The 10 point must system, the uh, uh, often how judging criteria are determined, and they're gonna exploit that system. They're gonna go out there, I've only got five minutes to work, so I'll work in a different manner. I know what scores, um, they're gonna do that. And, the biggest thing is you have to adjust for that, but you can't make those adjustments in MMA because yeah, it's just too difficult. Athletic commissions and no one wants to take a stand. No one wants to make a big sweeping change against anything just in case it might happen to be wrong and then everyone's going to point the finger at them and say, oh, you ruined it. But would you be, are you pro sort of half points? Are you pro a change? I'm, no, I'm, I'm only pro no 10 point must system for MMA. It doesn't belong. And I'm also pro longer than five minute rounds. I don't think five minutes is enough anymore. I think five minutes has turned into a bit of a sprint, a couple takedowns, and now you've won the round. And I'm also pro having the, the referees be more a part of the action and to, to be more vocal and more aggressive in the way that they judge these matches. I think it's pretty obvious how to fight for points. I think it's pretty obvious when people are doing it 
And I think it's also pretty obvious that things like fence grabbing should be an automatic deduction now. It's just too late. Eye gouges should be automatic deductions. I mean, it's just, I don't care if it's an accident anymore. It's too late. It's, too, it's gone on. It, obviously, it is so obvious. And if you ask any fighter, you, you can get away with so much out there. There's always at least one freebie, if not two or three. So it's got to end. If you don't want people to grab the cage, boom, point. If you're going to use 10-point must system. Or even you can just, with pride, they would give you a yellow card. So you got to be, they got to be more aggressive. You got to push the fighting more. You see a fighter just stalled up against the cage, not doing anything, break them. Their fighter's on top, just holding on, break them. Fighter's on bottom, just trying to stifle the action. Uh, you can penalize the fighter on the bottom. I mean, there's lots of things that, it can, that can be done, but I believe you need, ten, you need probably a, a 10 minute first round or something. You just need more time to get stuff working. And uh, you know, so a lot of times at the end of that five minutes, it feels like one fighter's just started to get some momentum going and it's done. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think tournaments. We need one night tournaments again. Every, so every combat sport, rounds, every, no, rounds, no, no, absolutely not. Uh, every, every combat sport, every, in fact, every competitive sport out there has tournaments, period. It's just a part of competition. But, they, but Bellator tried it, and it, unfortunately, too many people end up getting hurt, and so you have an alternate fight. One tournament in how many years? I'm saying, Josh. One tournament in how many, how many problems. tournaments have there really been since that last one? Yeah. None. So you, you can say one attempt over 10 years or something or had some hiccups, have more. You have to, you have to take the, the mean of things, not, not the exception. So, and you know what? Sometimes that happens. Oh, well, maybe a new star gets created. Steve Jenham got an opportunity because he got out there and someone got hurt. So he came in and he won UFC 3. I'm not saying Steve Jenham went on to become a great star, <laughs> but it was still opportunity, right? Now there was something new on the block, something new to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> reaction, what do you think? I mean, this is literally just happened, like, as we're eating. Forlorn and melancholy. <laughs> <laughs> I am struck by, <laughs> I've been stricken by a deep, longing sense of ennui. <laughs> If, uh, if they called you, would you take the fight? If they paid me 911, <laughs> if they send me the number, I will absolutely take the fight. Uh, if, they, they can, if they want a cha heavyweight championship main event, I'm your man. I'll go in. I'll take care of business, and I'll give them what they want. I'll give them what they need, which is a healthy, motivated championship fighter. That's what they'll get. What does go through your head? I mean, you haven't had a chance to talk to So many process. things that I do not want to actually say yeah. um, in public. Well, in this particular situation, what goes through your head? Because I wonder, I mean, is it, when you hear what's going on, is it immediately like, how do I work this to my advantage? How do I, how do I insert myself in this situation? Or do you, you have to say, I've got to fight, I can't think about this stuff right now? How, how does your mind work when you start hearing the champions are falling out, the challengers are falling out? It's just like when you see a hot chick break off from some other dude trying to talk to her and roll up to the bar solo. Opportunity, man. Opportunity. To get shot down again. And, but in this case, it's fighting, so I won't fail. <laughs> uh, of course. Uh, I have a manager handling this right now. I, I know what I can do. I know I have a fight ahead of me, which makes it so much easier to say, put me in. I'll, I'll go. You want a heavyweight championship? I mean, not, not, to, uh, you know, not to do anything to... Uh, uh, take away from Ben or to put him in, 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 in the, uh, the chicken coop, so to speak. I just, I'm, gonna, I'm ready, I'm willing, I'm capable. I'll fight Stipe. Uh, I'll, I'll go five rounds for a heavyweight title right now. We're good. Um, fact that Verdum got injured, I, I mean, maybe, maybe he is injured. But it almost seemed as if he was injured enough, but not so injured that he was going to fight Kane. Now that everything's swapped up, maybe he's injured enough that it's not worth it, and it's better to wait. It's, pl it's plausible. I'm not saying that's the case exactly. I don't really know. Natural, I wasn't there. It's a natural reaction, right? There is a lot of moving of pieces sometimes when it comes to fighting, to prize fighting. 
And, uh, you know, we've seen it happen in boxing many a time. Uh, stop one fight, move on to an, and, and disregard that, pull out of that fight, go to a different fight because it's a better paycheck or a better opportunity or, you know, maybe promoter switches. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen behind the scenes uh, that can affect these. But right now, whatever, for whatever the reason, um, Verdum's hurt, Kane's hurt, Stipe stepped up, now Stipe doesn't have a partner to dance with, I'll dance with him, and then we'll fight. Then maybe I'll dance with them again afterwards. A nice slow one, you know? We're, we're all beat up and bruised and battered, and you know, we're a little vulnerable. That's the time to uh, you know, go cheek to cheek on the dance floor. Yeah, right? <laughs> Mentally, how hard is it, how difficult is it to uh, deal with a new opponent when it's a last minute uh, replacement? Right now, not at all. I'm mean, I'm ready, and I'm ready to go. Doesn't matter. No, no, I just want to fight somebody. And he's not a huge departure from Rothwell, so. And, and you, you, you have the championship belt. Does that attitude change once you have the belt, or is it, is it fear of losing the belt, or does it matter? You always have to be somewhat aware of the ramifications of which fight you take and when and how and who and the timing of all that. But uh, you got to get the belt first before you got to worry about those things. So I really couldn't care less about that. What I could care about is winning that belt again and having that fight going into that Super Bowl weekend. Can you by the, the timing of, of this uh, announcement? It is very surprising. The timing is almost too perfect, but life is strange and chaotic. This could all be entirely on the level. It could also be a complete ploy. You, only time will tell, only the history books, and depending on who writes them, we'll let, we'll let you know what the reality of it is. And uh, injuries are a real thing in the sport, and if you are truly injured enough that you cannot compete, you know, that's a bummer, because now, I mean, there's only, the only thing that really bums me out are our injuries, because I like being an athlete, and I like going out there, and I like competing, and I like training, and I like doing athletic things. Not being able to move, sucks. That's, that's a real, that's a real bad trip. None of us really know exactly what's going on, but let's say Fabrizio didn't want to fight Stephen. Yes. And, and he's pulling out because of that. Is that understandable in a sense because you're preparing your, you know, your whole camp for, for one guy. In this case, you're preparing your camp for one guy who knows him very well. All of a sudden, 12 days out, a new opponent. Is that understandable that they can say, hey, I don't, you know, this one? You could argue. You could argue it. But in the end, I guess... I don't know. It depends on which party you're asking. Uh, I'm asking you. Oh, well, for me, it's totally, absolutely a-okay. Thank you. As long as I get the fight, then I completely <laughs> abide by it. I think it was a great choice. And I, I, I'm sorry you're injured. Glad it's right now, though. So are you starting to think about Steve Bay already? No, possibly. You know, a little bit. Just because his, his name came into the uh, conversation earlier, I heard he's a big beer drinker. He's from <laughs> Cleveland. Can't be that bad of a guy. Trains a strong style fight team. Those guys are cool. I like them. Uh, and uh, he's got a great accent. He's a barman. It's just great. It's like, you got to give a big cigar to that guy and maybe a keg of beer on the other shoulder. He's like uh, the Crusher, who nobody here will remember who the Crusher is. Yeah, he was a wrestler for Vern Gagne's AWA. He had a song after him that has like blurbs, little uh, little clips of him within the song, quipping, saying his stuff. I could jump off my bar stool and, and, and take these guys out and all kinds of stuff. So look up the Crusher and then make me some Crusher Stipe memes. <laughs> because I'm sure Stipe would agree. You haven't really, you're not really anybody unless you have silly memes about you. To jump in there, would it need to be like an, an interim title or anything like that, or does that matter? I mean, if this was just like a number one contender fight, interim title. I mean, it's set up for a title match. Let's keep it going. That's what they need on Super Bowl weekend. They need a title fight. They need a heavyweight title fight. That's what we can provide. Former champ, um, and uh, you know, a number one contender. That's what people want to see. They want to see championship level fights. They want to see the top guys go at it. We can do it.
things can change, man. I guess things, seem, things always change in the sport, huh? Well, you know everything happens for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Uh, was it Pablo and Aruba? Or there? No, yeah. no. <laughs> how, how, uh, how important is uh, is vengeance in your life? Does it does the Travis Brown fight bother you? Would you like to get that one back? You right can't now? get anything back in life. Trying to get anything back just allows you to allow things that are in front of you to get by and miss out. So you can't get you can't get shit back in your life. You got to deal with what you where you're at and what got you here. Um, I don't like that I lost to him. I don't like the way I performed. And that's it. I keep that in mind and make sure that I, I don't allow those things to happen again. Simple. How about when Crow Cop retired, though? Was there any party that was like, oh, let's do that one one more time? I would do one more time with anybody. Bar none. Even, even people I've beaten before. Plenty of those I'd fight again. Anybody you particularly want to beat up again? <laughs> nah. I mean... I always wanted that, that third one with uh, Noguera, but that's, there's, no, there's no potential for that. And there's actually no point anymore, so. Yeah. I'm curious for you, do you, does it help you if you have any kind of personal dislike of your opponent? Some people like to have that emotion of genuine dislike. Do you invent anything in your head for a reason this guy's trying to take some from me? Like, what's your mentality when you're staring down the opponent? Depends with every time. I, I don't think, motivation is motivation. So if something motivates you, it's always a plus. Yeah. Uh, I don't really need motivation. I'm motivated every day to beat the shit out of somebody. So it's, it's just icing on the cake. Does the favor fight still one that you're interested in? I'm interested in all fights. Do you have a fight that's going to pay me a lot of money that gets, that, that's, uh, that's going to be seen and heard and followed by a lot of people? I want that fight. Actually, if you had a fight that's going to pay me a ton of money that no one's going to watch it, I want that one too. <laughs> that name doesn't really mean, it doesn't mean anything more than anyone else to you. No. No. I mean, even if it did, what am I going to do? Can't do shit about it. He's in Ryzen. I'm in the UFC. There is no cross-pollination. So it would be pointless to waste any energy thinking about it. When you were a free agent in the UFC, you thought about signing him or there were some negotiations. Was there a hope that... Actually, I bet Juliana Pena 20 bucks that he would not end up in the UFC. She still owes me 20 bucks. However, I'll let her put that towards bail. <laughs> Bing! Gotcha, Juliana. I still want my 20 bucks. <laughs> hey, how much has uh, you know, coaching helped you? Uh, I don't know if it helps you... Stay interested. I know you're you're always interested in the sport, but you know what does it do for you when you can show people what you have? How, how much does that invigorate your life? Well, it makes me a better fighter. It makes me more knowledgeable. It makes it gives me more mastery of the sport. It keeps my brain moving. Keeps me operating in in, uh, in other other avenues. But also, it's me giving back to others, and it's me putting faith in. Uh, energy into uh, to helping other people live out their dreams, which is something that I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have people to help me. So I consider it uh, you know, passing passing it along. You not, know, I mean, not to steal anything from the Church of Latter Day Saints. <laughs> Kick an ass, pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find I've had this conversation with people before, and some of the women say that they believe it's true that oftentimes women in a gym are more coachable than men. I know you coach a lot of women fighters. Um, because they don't walk in there with this self-appointed, I'm a tough guy, I, I have to know how to beat somebody up, so that women have oftentimes been more coachable because they are more humble in their ability. Would you say? Women have been more coachable to a degree for me because all the shit they had to get through to get to this point uh, means that they were that committed. Although, I would say women's MMA is far more flaky, especially nowadays, really hard to, to get anybody locked down into things. And unless you have a, a solid money fight in, say, Invicta or the UFC, they are the hardest things to put together out of anything in the fight, in the, in the fight realm. They will just pass up fights, refuse them, pull out. I mean, it's so difficult to get a women's MMA fight going if you're not going to be in one of the major organizations. 
So your girlfriend, Colleen, obviously is in one of the major organizations, and you have a lot of good friends that have been in and still are in, in the big times. Um, do they see it still as a really uphill uphill battle, even though you know we know Ron is doing big things, Holly's doing big things, but do they still see it as, a, as an uphill climb? Uh, I imagine they must, because unless you're at the top, you're, you're, you're kind of at the bottom. Uh, and in, unless your name is Rhonda, then there's nothing else that compares. You know, Holly Holm is now up there, but partially because she got to fight and beat Rhonda. She hadn't have fought and beat Rhonda, uh, and all the PR machine and everything that came with that, and all the publicity and all the buildup, Holly Holm wouldn't be where she's at right now. Not to say that Holly Holm's skill and talent, and you know, it's not about what you deserve. It's just about how it plays out in the entertainment industry. It's different. Uh, you know, Cyborg is Cyborg, but if she didn't beat Gina Carano, she wouldn't be Cyborg as she is today. She, if she beat, I don't know, somebody else, wouldn't be the same. Wouldn't have the same effect. Yeah, I just wonder how hard. It's not that you, t it's, not, it's not even a matter of taking, right? Yeah. Holly Holm didn't take away from Rhonda. She didn't take Rhonda's fame and take it for herself. She just created her, by using the fame that Rhonda had, she used it to help just catapult her own fame. Well, Misha always was very honest about that, saying that, that having Rhonda as an adversary was so beneficial to her, and she appreciated that and knew how to sure. use Sure, and it it's going to make her a lot of money uh, if and when they rematch. You know, it's going to have more hype behind it. It's going to get more eyes. It's going to get more opportunity and more money. But, uh, you know, the fight is the fight is the fight. The fight itself is something entirely removed from that. So, uh, you know, it, it's good that opportunities exist, that a woman can exceed to, to such a level. It could be hosting SNL, but that doesn't mean you're going to, you know. It's still rare. Before, before Rhonda, there was Gina. Yeah. Gina was as big, if not bigger. Although, what Gina did was she paved the way for the ability to be in the PR machine and possibly work your way up a ladder that wasn't available before. So prior to Gina, would there be a Rhonda? I don't know, maybe not. Maybe Rhonda couldn't have been Rhonda. Now, maybe she couldn't have even been Gina then. It's so difficult, and, it's, and, and the way public perception and the entertainment industry works, it's so fluid. You know, Timing, luck, there's all kinds of stuff that go into that. The fighting, well, you know, that's hours in the gym, that's training, that's practice, that's execution. That, doesn't necess that warrants fighting ability, fighting wins, things in the athletic endeavors that does not make you a star, necessarily. I know we were talking a lot about Stipe, but um, what, what are your thoughts on Overeem lately, how he's doing, because he's winning fights? I think if it ain't Dutch, it ain't much. Mm -hmm. Is that even me? <laughs> it, was, it was Mike Myers' skin. <laughs> I don't know, he's Overeem. He's off Overeem and Reaming, uh, and, he, he, and he, he won a fight. Congrats. You're not impressed? I don't need to be impressed or unimpressed. He exists. He is an adversary in potentially in the future. And a uh, nice enough guy as far as I'm concerned. He's just there, you know what I mean? Until it becomes something that, that I have to, have to line up against. You know, he's just existing in the same space I am, trying to get the same cheddar cheese. Here's Verdum's actual quote. Mm. I think you were listening to it earlier. Yeah. Did it start uh, off with my friend? My friend. <laughs> and, a, and a big smile. Yeah. It said, uh, he had some injuries but was going to ignore them if Kane was still available. But the time is too short to quote unquote hide his injuries and map out a new strategy. For I knew it. It's, what you said. So it's exactly what I said already. So is that kind of a, I mean, is that kind of a, for lack of a better word, a shitty way for a champion to? Well, I could, I could completely just say something. Uh, bombastic and, and accusatory and negative right now to give myself some fame, but I'm not going to do that. I mean, what? he has to live with whatever decisions he makes, and you know, he, you know he's going to be upsetting the, the head office, of course. And he's saying that it's not reasonable for him to fight a different opponent that may require a different game plan, that may require a different what have you. Uh, Part of me understands that Lou, the uh, potential of losing that belt and what he will lose by losing the belt in terms of his money scale, his money scale, and his money scale, and then everything else. 
is a lot probably for him that he feels to risk. He does not want to risk the potential of walking in there into the cage and making less than he's making now. He probably feels like this opportunity to make this money, is this is it. He's 38, he's coming into his prime, he's at his best performances of, of his entire life. If he doesn't do it now, it's gone forever. He won't make that money again. You know, these are his opportunities for his, his paydays. So he's fearful of losing that. Understandably so. The way this game is structured, it is often win, lose, and it's it all. So I understand his fear, but you know, should he take that fight? I think he should. I think that's what he should step up and, and, and blast this guy. Or at least he should have come up with a better excuse. You know, but uh, it's his life to live. Not mine. The fans will judge him in whatever way they want to, and uh, and, and he's got to live with whatever decision that is. And I'm not going to sit here and just be like, "Oh, he's a punk. He's a pussy. He's this." Because I, I understand. I can understand where he's coming from. I can see his reasoning. What's the worst injury you fought with? Bent penis. <laughs> it's it was the worst injury, but it did give me a new creative angle on life. Is that is that your mighty most? Um, worst injury I've gone into a fight with? Yeah. I had a torn uh, rotator cuff and uh, on our, uh, I, had, I had stressed out rotator cuffs. I don't know how bad they were and a torn labrum. I went there and fought Crow Cop. My arm came out. There you go. I've walked into the ring with plenty of injuries, most of them psychological. <laughs> but uh, hey, I, I get what he's, I understand his reasoning. But when you say that in the public, when we're supposed to be swimming in, a, in the sea of tough guys, how does that, I mean, sometimes there's aspects of the business side of things that you just can't, you're not gonna get everybody to understand. But how much weighing of the of the options do you do? Because seriously, you, you know that yeah, there's a there's a line maybe your injury crosses where yeah, it is too much of a problem, and you really kind of don't know that until. Well, you what does that say about fight. Kane too? Oh, I was willing to fight Kane all fucked up, but not Stipe. So now you just this is why people should understand pro wrestling more. It's like now you just cut down your opponent. You just basically said that he's worth fighting injured, and I can beat him. Well, how good is he then? Now, I understand he's probably coming from a perspective of, well, I've already fought him again. I know what I'm dealing with. But uh, I don't see Kane. And, the only difference between Kane and Stipe is Stipe's got a little quicker hands, more technical, moves his head more, and wrestles less. That's what he's dealing with. Kane wrestles more, gets hit more, and has less polished boxing. There you go. That's the difference. If you could fight Kane, you could fight Stipe. If you believe you could fight Kane. Going in there and not knowing Kane has, you know, 17 vertebrae shot out from his back, getting suplexed by Daniel Cormier, or taking and then taking a tombstone off the second rope from Luke Rockhold in practice. <laughs> tombstone pile driver, if you need to really clarify that. Uh, so Verdum didn't know that Kane was hurt prior to, to Kane's announcement, right? All good to go. Kane's hurt. Okay, Stipe. Ah, you know what? Injury sounds like a good idea to me. Like I said, I saw him training last week. <laughs> I, I know, I know, no, I know no, Karen, you are the mastermind behind all of this. It's me, puppet, puppet master. <laughs> yeah. The war master and the puppet master. No, I, I can legitimately say I saw my own eyes that he was dealing with some issues. All right. Richard, we're all dealing with issues. <laughs> we're all dealing with issues. Prove it. Okay. We're all dealing with issues. That's why we're here, honestly. <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah, let's. We can get real dumb somewhere <laughs> I've been a barista before. Have you? Yeah. No. But, you know, that doesn't make Dad love me. <laughs> Find a happy place, don't you? <laughs> Have you been tested by Usada for this fight? No. No, definitely. Never. Really? So you saw 
We're going to say you've said some three times we're just trying to. I highly doubt that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he sat right where we were sitting the other day and told us that. Oh, well, I was tested seven times then. <laughs> However many times you said someone was tested, I was tested more. I promise you. I could be tested more. I got more blood and urine. <laughs> Anybody out there. You know all that stuff gets announced anyways, right? They just blow it out there like, hey, so-and-so's, you know, been tested and had his, his butthole fingered, you know, 17 times prior to this fight. You're like, wow, his prostate's amazing shape right now. <laughs> I guess all I'm saying is there's, there are better questions to ask. <laughs> I guess unless you're the USADA guy, you want to be mentioned a lot. And you're like, I'm the USADA rock star, the drug czar. He's got mirror shades. And every time he takes them on, puts them off, you hear that start of the song, right, right, the who. Right. Yeah! <laughs> I mean, if you want to be... <laughs> oh yes, I would definitely fight the crusher. Oh, do the turkey neck, do the hammer lock. I mean, no, Stepe. That could be Stepe's grandpa, maybe. I don't know. I don't think so. But you gotta listen to the. Cru He's awesome. The crusher is amazing. And, and if, yes, if Stipe, Stipe looks up the crusher, he should, he should understand where I'm coming from. I, I would hope that he would find what's so awesome about the crusher <laughs> as well. And he's from the AWA, Minnesota. That's not that far from Ohio. Yeah, why not? Stones throw. It's crows fly. Something. Yeah. As the, as witches, the, as the witches cartwheel. <laughs> 